Ah, happy International Women's Day to all my female colleagues. Uh, hello, I'm Hilary Lappin Scott. I'm the president of FEMS, and I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of women. We're going to have a discussion. So, International Women's Day. What is this discussion uh, all about? International Women's Day is actually being celebrated now for 110 years. And it's interesting to think and look back on what's been achieved by all of the women, their hard work, all of the pioneers that have gone before us. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion uh, now. But this year's theme is actually choose to challenge. It's a challenged world, is an alert world, and the focus is about individually that we're all responsible for thoughts and actions all day and every day, and not just on International Women's Day too. So we can all choose to challenge, we can all call out gender bias and inequalities, and we ought to, and what are we going to do to ensure that we're doing more of this? So choosing to seek out and celebrate women's achievements through International Women's Day will help us to create a much more uh, inclusive world. So, because really from challenge, that's when you get change happens. So, you know, let's all choose to challenge. So, as I said, I'm very happy to be joined by five women from across different career stages across microbiology and many of the different societies uh, of FEMS as well for a discussion really on how we choose to challenge. So I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about themselves and then have some discussions around the theme of International Women's Day and choosing to challenge. So first of all, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Branka to come on board and to introduce herself, please. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, I wish you all happy International Women's Day. Uh, I'm glad uh, that I could join this uh, uh, discussion and uh, thank you to Hillary and Joe for organizing this uh, every year in a different way. But uh, I hope uh, this uh, discussion uh, will be very successful. Uh, so just to introduce uh, myself uh, at the moment, I'm a secretary general uh, and uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, I can uh, uh, work uh, with the FAMS uh, team and uh, to improve in uh, all aspects uh, uh, our work uh, and to help uh, microbiologists uh, all over the Europe. Uh, uh, I am uh, coming from uh, Belgrade, uh, Serbia, uh, University of Belgrade, and I work in the Institute of Molecular Genetics and Genetic Engineering. And, uh, uh, of course, I'm a molecular biologist, microbiologist, working on the secondary metabolites uh, of uh, streptomyces, from streptomyces. And uh, recently, I started to work also in uh, environmental microbiology. But what I would like to stress at the, this point uh, is that uh, uh, I was the director of the Institute uh, for 12 years, and even longer, I was the head of the uh, laboratory. Uh, so uh, coming from a former socialist country, we had the uh, equal opportunity, both boys and girls, uh, in terms of uh, education. And I'm really proud to say that, uh, uh, let's say, in our institute, uh, uh, something like 90% of employees are women. <laughs> and uh, in many institutes and uh, universities, uh, uh, women are uh, at the position of uh, directors and uh, deans. Uh, so in that term, situation is... Uh, uh, good in Serbia, but uh, we will see later on where the obstacles are. So that's for now from me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Branka, and, and, and welcome. Uh, could I turn next to Ali, please? Hi, um, my name is Ali Hughes. I'm originally from Ireland, and I am now doing my PhD at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland. Uh, focusing on marine biotechnology and drug discovery. 
I'm just in the last few months of that now, so I'm finishing up at September 2021. I'm also an editor and a social media manager with Women in Ocean Science, which is an international community supporting women working in marine sciences, um, and an early career research rep with the Scottish University Life Sciences Alliance. Excellent, and welcome to you, uh, uh, Ali, as well. Can I turn next to uh, Diana, please? Hi, everyone. Um, happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Diana Gethby, and I'm a first year PhD student at Newcastle University. I'm currently studying sugar breakdown and bacteroides um, in the low lab. And um, I'm originally from Kenya, but as you can tell from my accent, I grew up in Scotland and that's where my love for science began. So um, I chose to do a microbiology degree at the University of Strathclyde and that led me to doing my PhD. Um, I also run a blog um, where I talk about some issues um, that black women in Britain face, um, science as well, um, life, but, uh, lifestyle and well-being as well. So yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I can't wait for the discussion. Oh, you're very welcome as, as well, Diana. Could I turn next to Sylvia, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, happy International Women's Day. Um, my name is Sylvia and I'm originally from Greece, but uh, currently I'm based in Aberdeen in Scotland. Uh, I am a postdoctoral researcher. Although I'm a chemist by training, I have shifted into microbiology. Uh, I work with the marine secondary metabolites uh, uh, of reactive, but uh, currently I'm working on a more of an environmental microbiology project, working with cyanotoxins at uh, Robert Gordon University uh, here in Aberdeen. Um, well, as I said, I'm originally from Greece, but uh, throughout my PhD and my career in academia, I moved around quite a bit. So I worked and lived in Ireland, in the UK and the United States. Um, and except uh, science, I'm also very interested in uh, science communication and public engagement. And I have been involved in several events and mainly I'm interested in uh, mentoring schemes uh, to support, especially younger female uh, students that would like to uh, follow a career path in, into science. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you again. You're very welcome uh, to join in this as well, uh, Sylvia. Then, then our uh, last guest, last but not least, of course, uh, is uh, Egli, please, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Happy International Women's Day from Vilnius, Lithuania. And I am Egli Lastarskene. I am the director of the Institute of Biosciences here at Vilnius University. And my institute belongs to the Life Science Center, to the big department, and I am the head of the smaller part of it. And also, I am the member of the board of Lithuanian uh, Microbiological Society and responsible, the head of the FEMS education group in Lithuanian Microbiological Society. And my research is, um, actually, I'm working pretty much in the manly field, kind of, in the electroporation, application of the electroporation for the inactivation of microorganisms, working mainly with the skin, about pathogenic yeasts and bacteria. So that's the main topic of my research. Uh, well, nice thank you. you. Thank you all, all of you. And it's very nice to have an opportunity to have a discussion with you as we celebrate uh, International Women's Day right across all of the various societies within, within FEMS. So as I said, my name's Hilary Lappin uh, Scott. Uh, in all of the history of FEMS, I'm just the second female president to be elected. Uh, my research group works on biofilms and biodegradation of pollutants, but one of my main passions uh, is about campaigning for greater inclusion for girls and women in STEM uh, as well. I'm from a very humble background uh, where most of the girls would be encouraged to leave school at the age of 16 and go to work and contribute money to support the family. Uh, as well. So I'm first in my family to get a PhD and become a scientist and to become an academic. So uh, again, a little bit of a different route uh, as well. So uh, colleagues uh, in this Choose to Challenge, uh, there's a couple of areas I think that it would be really great to hear uh, some of your thoughts on. 
So maybe we could get started on kind of a broad theme of what do we feel are the challenges that are facing women in 2021? And you know, do we feel that's changed at all for those of us who've been uh, working as scientists and academics for uh, several years? What do we feel that the challenges are from that? Um, anyone have any any thoughts that they'd that they'd like to put across, please? Oh yes, if I can turn to you first, uh, Egli, please. Thank you. Yeah, so I think as compare the challenges, because I'm not so young scientist anymore, so I can can remember the past. So move, we moved a lot as a society, as the women in science, and we changed a lot of policies. So, but I think we need to continue in this field because the job is not done yet. We are treated differently. It's not so harsh anymore as it was before, you know, when everyone was looking at the women and telling your places at home and don't do science at all. Of course, we have the liberty now, but we need, we're still facing some challenges in the different relation towards us, yes? If the man is coming, it's kind of common sense that he knows the topic, that he is the great scientist and the women need to prove it. Each day we need to prove that we are worth to be here and to, to have that position. So I think there is a lot of work in front of us for the next generation that is coming after us, you know, to, to not to have such as challenges anymore, that each person should be treated equally. So I think that that's the main, not to stop in the middle of the way at the moment. Yeah, you've made some points, very, very compelling points there, actually, that women still get asked to prove themselves uh, as well. And I, I'll turn to Ali in a moment, but I'm, I'm remembering um, some of the things that Branka was saying in her introduction that, you know, in, um, men, within her institution, that most people are women, uh, even still, we see where there's a very large number of women working in microbiology, often the leadership positions are still occupied by, by men. And, um, you know, then it becomes a hard job to be the first woman to do fill in the dots uh, uh, there as well. And it, it really becomes a challenge. Uh, could I turn to you, Ali, please, on your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think that we have progressed somewhat in terms of of representation of women in science at certain levels, particularly at lower levels. Um, I remember from when even I was doing my undergraduate degree a few years ago, uh, there wasn't that many women in my undergraduate class, but we now have, have almost equal representation in, in science subjects at university level, at the undergraduate level. Um, I think now we're starting to get the better representation of women at, at master's and PhD level. Um, again, I'm, I'm quite lucky to work in a department that has quite a lot of female PhD students and master's students. Um, but as we keep going up those ranks of leadership, it just gets fewer and fewer. We see, we see less and less women. Um, and therefore, we don't have those role models that we need. I think we're still lacking in terms of role models, seeing women doing these positions and being successful in these positions and, and not being slated for it as well. I think a lot of time when women are successful and get into these leadership positions, there's a very different language that is used uh, to describe these women compared to their male counterparts. And it's very discouraging for women who are in early career stages uh, to then want to pursue that career. You know, it, it's kind of weighing up the risks and the rewards of pursuing such a career. Um, and it's still very difficult for, for us to, to kind of close that gap in representation as well as the, the literal gap in our, our pay and um, it's still an issue that we're fighting today in 2021 which is just beyond belief at this stage that there is still issues around um, the pay that, that women are receiving across the world for doing the same job as a man. I, I think that you've made some really good points uh, uh, Ali that um, in most countries and in most laboratories where we see the further up the rank you go it's kind of that pyramid still um, and you know we can all sit and, and, and look at successes and there's been lots of successes uh, for, for women we've got um, uh, Nobel Prize winners uh, in chemistry for two women for the first time ever which is 
fantastic. I'm delighted that um, the, they will be speaking at the conference that we're holding in June uh, as well, Emmanuel Charpentier, superb. Um, but there's there really just a not enough role models. So those women who've kind of worked and worked to get right to the top of that, uh, of that pyramid, then I feel get asked to do a lot. Now, so as well as the day job, they get a lot on their shoulders, you know, oh, could you be the one who does this? Can you be the one who comes uh, and speaks on, on this issue? And um, that, that's very, very difficult too. So, you know, we do need to see successful women so that, you know, girls as well as women in, can look and go, oh, actually, if you can see yourself at the front of a room, I think that that makes a difference. You go, there's somebody who's like me for various reasons. I can see myself in that person who's at the front of the room. So if they can do it, then you know what? You know, I'm going to go all out for this and um, that we then again uh, choose to challenge. But I, I was very taken by also what you said, Ali, about different languages to, to use to describe successful women. And, you know, I think that's something that we'll pick up through our through this discussion over over the coming uh, discussion points that we're going to raise as well. Uh, is there anything further on that? Otherwise, I want to move on to another important topic that we're asked a lot as as well as doing excellent bench science and, and all of the other jobs around being a, a working scientist how is it that we could expand our network as women? So I think that's a useful thing to think about is if anyone has any tips or any uh, recipes for success, they think, well, these are a few things that I did uh, to, in order to expand my network. What is it that you feel are recipes for success there? So that, you know, when I was uh, at the early career stage that some of you guys are, I honestly thought it was enough to shut the lab door, to get my head down on the bench and just work, work at getting good papers and good output. And I didn't know anything about networking. And then suddenly you look up and think, you know, I thought somebody would might have noticed and would there be a chance for promotion? And then you find not a chance. The networking, the how you, you can then use that network becomes a recipe for success. So anyone, any any thoughts on that at all, on what they've done or what they've seen others do? Uh, Sylvia, please, if I could turn to you. Uh, yeah, so I, I completely agree about the network uh, issue. And I when I first started my PhD, I was also thinking it's okay, as long as I have my um, results uh, from my lab work, then I don't need anything else to get my postdoc or my future job. But, um, this is really not true. Uh, reality is completely different. Uh, it's all about knowing a lot of people and not necessarily knowing the right people, but because it's it's also about being at the right place, the right time. Uh, but uh, networking, meeting as many people as you can. But uh, I think that what people need to think uh, is that we need to have a broad network. So for example, uh, in, my, uh, in my field that I'm working in natural products is not just meeting the natural product scientist. Um, expand your network. Talk, talk to people that you might not even think about uh, talking to them because you never know where the opportunity is uh, in the future and where like a, a career might lie within that, um, uh, that network event. Also, the most important thing, as we all know, is uh, attending conferences, which it is a great way of meeting people. But um, we live in the social media era, and I must say that I have met amazing people through Twitter. We've never met in person, but we know each other. We have talked through direct messages. And then uh, I remember actually one instance that um, I was talking to one scientist through Twitter, and then we happened to meet at the conference, and we're like, oh, I know you. You look familiar, but we've never met. Ah, yeah, it was Twitter. Um, so definitely social media channels are a way to, to meet a lot of uh, interesting and amazing scientists. Yeah, you've made some really great points there, uh, Sylvia. Thank you very much. Uh, Egle, to you, please. You had some points. 
Yeah, and actually, I think that this is the place where Thames can step in a bit in, with the help, you know, in making that network, you know, in building some some mentoring system, maybe, you know, some, I don't know, some annual discussion panel, like monthly, once per three months, you know, <laughs> to discuss the, the challenges and the problems. And another thing, another issue that I want to talk about, actually, about uh, when we were talking about that knowing the right people, just working in the lab, maybe it's going to be enough. It's never enough. And it's the, the huge difference. If you have the supervisor women, she's going to help you a bit, you know, she's going to show you the people, she's going to help you to make those relationships. But uh, as I was working and my supervisor was the man, he was doing everything instead of me. If I needed something, he was making the agreements for me. It was very helpful. It was very nice. I appreciated it a lot, but I never built up my own network. And everyone knew me only as a, his student, his, just his PhD. And when I was coming somewhere and, and introducing myself, everyone was telling, oh, I know you are the, that guy's student. <laughs> So that, that is about also about opening the doors a bit for the early stage, you know, researchers and helping them a bit to move and to build up that network for themselves. So maybe we can, you know, help a bit in this. Yeah, yeah, that's some good, really good points there. Can I turn to you, Diana, please? Sure. Um, I really like what you said, Sylvia, about, you know, using social media and quite a lot of people were quite nervous to sort of reach out to, to people <laughs> who they've never met before. But it's been an amazing tool. There's such an amazing community of scientists um, all over the world on social media that you can't have access to in person, of course, with location. And, um, you know, in the past year with COVID, we've not even been able to travel. Um, but even things like sharing people's research is so important. Um, there's lots of people who um, run accounts who are able to sort of share, um, you know, what other people are doing in their own field or even other, other people's fields as well. And that creates some sort of, you know, some camaraderie almost of, um, you know, that we're all, um, we're all scientists, but we've got different branches. And um, there's also different networks as well. And if there's not a network in, um, in your particular field or something that you think would benefit you and other people, make one. Um, you know, it's, it thinks, I think we need to sort of start trying to think outside the box and not have everything um, on a platter for us sometimes. We just need to make the things um, to expand that network um, as well. Uh, yeah, and just speaking to people and coming to people with propositions as well. Um, you know, if you've got an idea to, to collaborate on, on, on something, um, do that as well. Really, really good points there uh, too. So thank you, Diana. I'll pick up a couple of them uh, when, when after we hear from uh, Ali as well, please. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to, to follow on from, from the sort of networking, being in the right place in the right time and utilizing social media. And I just want to say to like any woman that's listening to this stream um, at the minute, stop selling yourself short is probably the biggest thing that affects our ability to network and to do that is that we are constantly questioning whether we're qualified enough for this, whether, you know, should we reach out to that person? Are we really in a high enough position to be able to, to email the president of this society or, or, you know, someone who's in an important position? Um, and I would just say, just go for it. The worst thing that's gonna happen is you're not gonna get a response or you're gonna get a no but you won't know until you put yourself out there. And it's something that when you compare, I think particularly when you compare men and women together, it's one thing that men are incredibly good at doing. I've, I've had men just walk up to me and they have no idea who I am, but they are very confidently sticking their hand out saying, hi, I am so-and-so, this is who I am and this is what I want. Um, and I very rarely see women do it. And I think that, you know, we are doing just as great of work um, we are just as important. What we have to say is just as important. So stop selling yourself short. Go and send that email. Go and introduce yourself to that person. Go apply for that internship. Whatever it is, go do it. <laughs> yeah, some really, really uh, good points there. Uh, we were mentioning there about, you know, what could FEMS do uh, as well? Uh, actually, what I've done for about the last three, four FEMS conferences is that I run a, a session for early career researchers, and it's about how to network and how to get the most from a conference. 
And, you know, this is one of the exact things that I say. Don't sit there quietly thinking people will notice you because you're working hard. I did that. It doesn't get you noticed at all. It is about who can, you know, how can your advisor open doors for you and pushing your advisor, your mentors uh, on that. Social media, like you've said, there is such a good way forward. Uh, I've often, as, uh, as you guys were saying, have met people at conference. Thought, yeah, I know you from Twitter. And it's a great way uh, to do that. Uh, did you have anything to add to that, Bran Branca, uh, at all? Uh, not too much, uh, you said all. <laughs> I just wanted to agree with uh, Sylvia. You don't know where is your... Uh, chance so uh, it's not uh, uh, important just to uh, network within uh, scientists uh, in your field it's important uh, to go out to outreach to the popularization uh, to do popularization and communication of science also uh, keep in contact with your former students uh, that's important uh, they are moving uh, uh, like uh, Sylvia said, from uh, Greece uh, to UK and then further on, and they meet another people. So it's important also to keep contact with all your former uh, students, follow their career, and uh, also uh, make respect uh, to your professors as well. <laughs> as uh, Eagle said, uh, that, uh, some of them are nice person and uh, network with them as well. No, I think yeah. we've got some really great points have, have come across from that. So uh, thank you. I mean, if you think of, of women and all the challenges that they can have through uh, a, a lifetime uh, of working, some of the challenges are around women who are mothers and what the difficulties would be, for example, in terms of attending a conference. Um, so I think it'd be a, a really good idea if we give that a, a, a bit of thought of what is it that's available because we don't want this important stages in a woman's life, but we still want uh, that women have an opportunity still to participate in conferences uh, and similarly that they feel uh, supported when they wish to do that as well. Um, I'm wondering, Sylvia, did you have any uh, thoughts or comments on that, please? Uh, yeah, I'm not a mother myself, but uh, I have a lot of colleagues that they're great scientists and they have uh, kids and they have shared some of their thoughts and concerns around this matter. So, for example, um, when there is a conference that they would like to attend, I remember one colleague of mine, she was saying that I prefer uh, to go I choose a conference within Europe than a an international one that it might be in Asia or in Australia because knock on wood something happens of course it's a lot harder to travel from that far away unless whereas a, a European conference it means that it might be like within two maximum four hours flight away um, and I understand I, I understand the concern and I completely understand the the logic behind it but it's just so unfair that for example, me that I don't have any children, I am able to go to Asia or to Australia to attend these conferences. And of course, these are probably international conferences. So this is, ties back to the networking um, issue that we were talking about in the previous point. So it seems that I would get more chances of meeting more people and that my colleague that she has decided to have a family. And I, I really feel it's so unfair. And um, although there are uh, conferences that they provide some funding, like, you know, the same as travel funds, there is a small grant for that, but it's not always enough or is not always ideal. Yes, I have seen now that some societies offered uh, funding for this. I think it's more common if I look back maybe over um, 10, 12 years of going to of going to conferences, it's much more common now to see young children uh, in a conference venue. Uh, it's much more common that there might be a crash facility uh, there and frequently uh, this is a kind of at a subsidized level uh, as well. So definitely I think here there's uh, that there has been improvement. Uh, Egle, did you have any points to raise on this please? Uh, 
Yes, yeah, since I am the mother of two kids, so I can tell everything from my own experience. And actually, I must be honest, my scientific travels were frozen for five years. Because I got the two kids one after other, and it was, it was just impossible for me to travel. Because the two small kids at home, I couldn't leave them for one week, for even for four days, it was challenging all the time. So, of course, the pandemic maybe showed us now the new opportunities yeah, to participate in the conferences remotely, and it, it's opening the horizons a bit, but it's still, like Sylvia told, about, uh, conferences are about networking. So if you're going to attend remotely, you're not going to get that opportunity you know, to make some, some new connections. So yeah, some so some some funding system to be able to travel with the kids maybe it would help a lot because it's not not a big issue to do actually just a little a little push from the from the side of the funding and it would it can happen. Yes, I I, I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, I had. Uh, a, a child very, very early on when I was appointed as an academic. And, you know, it wasn't possible to take any paid leave at all. Uh, I had to keep working um, throughout from, uh, from my, when my son was five weeks old. Um, and if I wanted to go to a conference, which I did go in the first, even in the, of, of him being in the first year uh, old, uh, and then I had to get family members would come and, and stay at the house and help uh, out. But it's very, very difficult uh, still. And we just don't want to see that disadvantaging uh, 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 women at all. Any further points on that? Oh, uh, Bran Branca, please. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we are now in a completely different uh, situation. Uh, because of uh, this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, so uh, on one hand, uh, this is a, a sort of advantage that we have uh, uh, online uh, conferences, uh, which is not uh, the same as a live conferences when you have a, a possibility to meet people, chat with people uh, and uh, uh, make uh, new uh, connections. And uh, the other thing is uh, that uh, Many parents are uh, now in a very, very difficult uh, situation because uh, some of the kindergartens are not working, schools are not working. Uh, they have to stay at home and uh, do parallel uh, their own job and uh, uh, to take care of uh, education of their kids uh, because they have uh, online uh, uh, schools. Uh, so it's uh, really, really a nightmare for uh, many parents uh, they have uh, young children or uh, children that are going uh, to school. Uh, so I think that we all hope that uh, this situation uh, will end <laughs> soon and that kids will go to school and we will go to work and to conferences. <laughs> yes, absolutely agree agree with that and i know that we're all looking forward to I've, and i hope to get a chance to meet up with you all soon in person <clears throat> as well one thing that's very very much on my mind as fems president is about the participation and representation of women of color as well but also how that intersects with kind of wider representation of women in science so you know i'd be really keen uh, to hear your points of view um could I start with you first, Diana, please? Okay. Um, yeah, definitely. For a long time, I know we've all been, you know, sort of fighting against misogyny and stereotypes of women um, in order for gender equality to be established in all the areas of life. Um, and in science, we've got a hugely male-dominated um, field. However, I think what's often missed in these conversations is how race and class intersect with female representation. Um, you know, it's not quite outrageous to assume that, you know, these key, key factors um, almost form a barricade for women of colour to, to get, you know, granted equality, um, even, even when it comes to conversations around gender equality. Um, there's a very visible totem pole um, in all work, workplaces. And as sad as it sounds, it's actually one of the main reasons I chose to pursue a PhD myself. 
um, I knew to get the to achieve the goals that I wanted to achieve, it'd be extremely difficult to do without a title to back up my capability um, and all my work. So I'm very aware that um, that equity has to sort of come into place in terms of equality. Um, so I think women of colour, you know, unfortunately aren't afforded the same the same opportunities in science um, when it comes to closing the gender gap. And that's probably why there's a 20% gap between, you know, women of um, colour, um, women of colour and white counterparts as well, and the makeup of the STEM workforce. So the issues of race and class definitely need to be discussed a lot more when it comes to gender equality. It's not enough to just say, you know, yes, it exists and there's a problem, but actually having solutions based conversations and say, you know, what are we going to do to make sure that the women of colour are actually represented in this in the same way as white women. Yeah, yeah, you've made some really good points there around ensuring that women of colour participate as well, that they're supported to be able to, they're represented, but they're able to participate, that there's a voice that their, their voices will be listened to as well. And it's that role models again, if we could, you know, who can I see at the front of the room? Who can I see are the people that are, that are speaking, that are becoming role models? And it, God, it really, really makes that, that bigger difference. Uh, could I turn to you, Ali, please? Yeah, just on the back of what Diana was saying, I think this is a, a good time to sort of mention that the theme for International Women's Day this year is choose the challenge. Um, and I think it's very important that although we are still dealing with, with, with sexism and misogyny and, and gender equity issues, as, as a white woman from, you know, from a developed country, from, you know, a rich country, I have an awful lot more privilege and um, even though I think that I don't, you know, like I feel like I'm, I'm still at the bottom of the pool, but I do have a lot of privilege in my position, as do um, other white women and men. We're not forgetting you in this conversation either. And um, so I think it's really important to choose to challenge the people around you to to raise those voices, to highlight it. It shouldn't just be left to black women and women of color and people of color to promote themselves and to fix this issue. This is, this is a systemic issue that was built without their, 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 their knowledge, without their consent in many, in many, many situations. This was done to purposefully to disadvantage people of color. Um, and I think it's really important that we choose to challenge this and that in any situation where, and obviously this depends on people being able to use their privilege and feeling comfortable to do so, but even within your personal circles, just challenging these things um, asking questions about the systems that are in place, asking questions about the curriculum you're being taught at school and whether this is a fair view that you're getting, whether there are people being left out of this narrative. Um, and I think that's somewhere that, that we can really help um, support other women um, and not just leave, leave all of the work of handling sexism and racism on the shoulder um, of women of colour because it's, it's a huge, huge load to carry. So we need to share that out. Oh, that's a, such a good point. Points there that Diana and and Ali's made, and you're right, uh, Ali, to uh, to remind us, those of us who are you know white women, that we are privileged, and it is part of our job. And for you know someone like myself, I have to recognise that being a more senior white woman as well brings brings privileges. You know, so myself and others like me. We have to challenge, we have to raise the voices as well. Use your voices, call, call it out and absolutely choose to challenge. And I think that, is, you know, that to me, I feel is one of the main messages that I'd like to get out of, of this discussion today and, uh, and to highlight that because I think it's such, such um, a, a key point. Was there anything else from uh, anyone else on that? Otherwise I'll slide into do you know another aspect i think that's perhaps related it's about the way women are perceived and recognized in the media but in many aspects of of our daily lives as as scientists and it's where for example we've seen that um on the news and i'm thinking here from a uk perspective that very frequently when there's experts on on covid uh, on the tv uh, that the men will be given, no, oh, then this is Professor X, Y, and Z, and please speak now, and turning to the females, and oh, now it's Paula's turn, you know, over to you. And 
there isn't the courtesy of and the respect shown to what women have achieved by by using uh, the titles and uh, we do need to call that out uh, as well i wondered uh, ali perhaps you do you have any any thoughts on on that yeah, I think it's a really valid point to make that, that women are not given the same level of respect. Um, and I kind of touched on it at the start as well about the language that is used. Um, it's amazing how, you know, between a man and a woman, the word changes from boss to bossy. You know, it's it's the language that we use. It's not giving people, it's not giving women their, you know, their fair dues for the work that they've put in. Um, I think we saw this recently with um Oh, and I'm going to get it wrong now. The um, was it the Wall Street Journal? I don't want to throw them under the bus uh, <laughs> unfairly. Uh, that published an article, you know, laughing at Dr. Jill Biden wanting to use her title, which she earned through studying for a PhD, and absolutely has the right to use that title. Um, and and they saw that this was almost comical that you know a woman should demand respect in such a way to use her doctor title even though she's just the first lady she's just supposed to be there to be beside the president the important person in the relationship um, and and that's just incredibly unfair one of the things that I loved seeing on the back of that was women on twitter changing their their twitter handles to say that they were dr so-and-so and professor so-and-so hope in a few months time I'll be able to join them in changing my own twitter handle um, and I think that's really important that when when something happens where a woman is being called out and not being given the respect that she deserves, that we come together as a community to support that woman, to call it out and to do what we can. And, and something like that is, is quite a small gesture to do. It doesn't, it doesn't put anyone at harm. You're not opening yourself up to, to any particular criticism by doing it. But it's just those small gestures just to show some solidarity, which I think um, is really important for, for us to support one another through this. Um, and as well, men, make sure to, to give us our titles too, um, and anyone else, um, just make sure to, to give us our credit. <laughs> I think you've made some very, very good points there. And I can remember actually from a FEMS board meeting uh, a few years ago that I, when I was the vice president, and one of the women in the room, one of the women board directors made a point and um, it, it wasn't picked up. And then five minutes later, one of the men made the same point. So I actually stopped the meeting and I said, excuse me, the woman in the room there, I'll call her Ellie, has made that exact point. So, you know, why are you repeating it? That's her point of view. And, you know, it's about calling it out when, when we see that. Uh, did you have something to add to that, Sylvia, please? Um, yeah, so really great points there. And what I wanted to connect this is that these kind of uh, behaviors and this way that uh, women have to prove themselves that they do deserve the PhD, we work as hard, if not harder than, than uh, our male colleagues, because some of us had kids while in PhD, or we had kids while doing a postdoc and looking for the second one. So we do deserve the title, but also I wanted to point out that we are here to serve to serve as role models for the younger generation. So they need to know that becoming a female scientist is actually worth it. And we need to change this perception of uh, females being not respected as, as much as male because they're students or early career researchers that they want to follow this path. And we need to let them know that it is great to be a female scientist. Some, some really, really good points there. And I was thinking about this language that's used about women and thinking of my own experiences. You know, yeah, I've had words like bossy used to go, no, no, I'm the boss. It's not bossy, I'm the, I'm the boss. Or feisty, this word, it's, do you ever hear a man get called feisty? You know, I'd one of my bosses uh, would always, oh, yeah, I love feisty women. And, you know, yeah. anyway, uh, Egli, can I turn to you just before we move on, please? Yes, I just wanted to say a few things about that topic. So actually, it's about us supporting each other. 
And it's always about supporting it. And like Hillary, she stopped the meeting to point it, you know, that the women made the nice idea and she she did it, you know, not that man that repeated after her. Sometimes are you maybe someone is too shy to to just to stop everything and to to correct or something, but we need to get united a bit, you know, in this field. And if you see the person that is too shy, maybe you can just stop the meeting and tell that let's give the word to this person. Let's hear the voice of the woman, because actually sometimes it's really difficult to interrupt the man, the manly society. But if you're going to be united, I think everything is doable. I think that's a really good point. I mean, I look for ways in meetings to take some of the, the points that women have made and emphasize them, you know, and refer to them in meetings, you know, oh, that was a great point that Ali made. Thank you very much earlier. And, you know, just working in that way that's coordinated to give support to other women that are in the room really makes a difference. And then you find more people find a voice. Um, uh, just because the clock is ticking, a little bit of a different issue now. And that's about when we're training our uh, PhD students and our postdocs, and then what might we do in terms of thinking about women moving from academia into industry? Okay, so that concept of thinking that there's lots of different careers. If you do a PhD, do a postdoc, it's not the only one route is to stay in academia. I wondered if any of you had any kind of um, uh, good examples of uh, perhaps women who have made that change from academia to industry or, you know, how, how might we encourage more women to think of these particular uh, opportunities of going into, you know, working in for, for the government or um, working in publishing, uh, working in scientific writing, working for industry as well. Um, I mean, if um, I, I could start off on that, I've had uh, actually with my various uh, PhD students, um, I think 65% of my, my PhD students have been, have, have been female. And I had a, a, a lot of the funding that I got was actually from businesses uh, and from industry. And we had very regular reporting that there would be reports to write would be lots and lots of visitors to the lab who came from businesses and just that way of introducing your lab your lab group to people working from different companies and get them to you know encourage that them and support them to give presentations and to speak and it kind of erodes the barriers between what the different jobs are in fact it's going on to say as a PhD student, as a postdoc, you've got loads of skills that are transferable uh, into the world of, of business and industry. So what we've done in FEMS is we've set up some new initiatives around policy and working with businesses. Uh, Branka, might you be able to tell us a little bit about that initiative, please, Branka, about what we're doing? Uh, yes, uh, actually now we have... Uh... A new director uh, in the FEMS uh, uh, working on uh, business and uh, uh, policy, and uh, we are trying uh, to connect uh, in, uh, people from uh, uh, to uh, more engage microbiologists working in the industry to be member of uh, FEMS. So we are trying uh, to find a way. Uh, how to uh, engage these people. Uh, we don't know uh, uh, much about them, uh, only if they are members of some particular societies, but uh, it is uh, important for us uh, to know uh, more about people working in the industry. We all know uh, different examples. Uh, personally, we know people who establish companies or just go to work in a, in a big uh, pharma company or biotechnology companies, but uh, actually uh, we have to network with those people and to uh, show uh, good examples, uh, role models uh, uh, for young microbiologists uh, how to uh, move from academia to industry 
uh, how uh, they can be successful to establish their own companies. Uh, I work in a country that is in a transition and uh, our uh, industry is uh, almost destroyed. Uh, they're only uh, big uh, international uh, companies coming now and establishing different uh, businesses, but uh, uh, we need uh, uh, more interaction uh, with the uh, people who have uh, their own ideas, uh, own business plans. And uh, now in, uh, in my country, we are trying to do this. And I think that uh, FAMS is also uh, a good platform uh, to establish this network uh, across the, the Europe. And uh, it is very, very important uh, that uh, women uh, play uh, the role and find their uh, uh, piece of cake uh, in, uh, in this uh, part of the, of the business. So I hope that uh, uh, with some uh, new ideas, uh, we can uh, come uh, to you and uh, uh, see what uh, can be done in the future. That's a really good point, uh, actually, um, in terms of the whole variety. And you quite rightly um, pointed out there, Branka, that what about women being entrepreneurs and taking their science ideas and setting up their own uh, businesses? So I'm really thrilled that over the last uh, months that we are taking this new initiative uh, and that in the conference, our conference in June, we will be having some discussions with businesses about how to support women to be entrepreneurs and set up their own business too. But that helps me kind of slide into a, almost our last question. Um, as as Branka has brought up FEMS and, and what they're doing, it's kind of what more could women, uh, pardon me, what more could FEMS do? to encourage and support women. Do you have ideas here where you really want to push FEMS in terms of, of what they could or, or ought to be doing uh, to make a difference? So any ways that you would choose to challenge FEMS here as an organization? Any thoughts, anything, Diana, any thoughts that you think, come on, this is, you know, this is your role FEMS, step up. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think definitely just exposure and opportunities being present. Um, I think, you know, things like this, you know, this conversation that we're having is is amazing because we're bringing um, the the challenges to, to, to the forefront, to the forefront, sorry. Um, but actually having things like mentorship schemes, um, the initiatives that Branka mentioned, um, opportunities to talk to business leaders, um, having those role models as well, you know, their front and center for you to speak to and, and see someone that you could be in the future as well. And um, I think it all comes down to money. <laughs> um, it all comes down to funding and, um, and making things, things accessible because, um, you know, it would be great to be able to do things and, you know, and just have the, the experience, but people can't afford to take time out of their research or time out of their, um, you know, their personal finances to um to do things that aren't funded so um making sure that everybody and every woman um is able to access these opportunities um is definitely the way forward to make sure that we are um we're rising through the ranks and we have a fairer um a fairer way to get to to get to the top uh, that, that's some really great points uh, that, that you've made there. So thank you very much. Have we got Ali back uh, in the room? Hi, hi, apologies <laughs> uh, there for that. Any other comments on terms of how we might push FEMS to, uh, and challenge FEMS to do more, to step up and, uh, and support, uh, to give support to women? Any final thoughts? No, I'll, oh, yes, yep, please Ali, yeah. Sorry, I may be repeating what, what some of the rest of you have said, because of course it wouldn't wouldn't be 2021 without some technical issues. Um, but yeah, um, one thing that I think is, is, is really great and that some societies have started doing is kind of doing some of their own studies and surveys into issues that face their community. 
Um, and I think FEMS is in a really powerful position to be able to do this because there's so many um, member societies across Europe that focus on, on different areas of, of uh, microbiology um, as well as, as different areas geographically as well. Um, so it would be great. Um, an example of that is the Royal Society of Chemistry. They've published quite a few studies um, about, you know, uh, they, they've done research into the experience of women um, in, in chemistry fields in the UK in particular, I think. Um, and that would be a really great thing to see forward is just FEMS sort of driving some of those conversations. Um, I think it's, it would be a really great thing to, to bring forward. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then um, uh, th I've really enjoyed uh, working with uh, all of you over the last hour or so. I just thought we'd kind of wrap up uh, this. Uh, the time's gone really quickly, hasn't it? Where did it go? It's been good fun. I've really enjoyed it. But I just wondered if each of you maybe have a final comment on, on anything that's kind of been popping in your head and you haven't had a chance to say uh, regarding this International Women's Day and and, and choose to challenge. So if I go perhaps to you, Branka, first, was there anything you didn't get chance to say that you think this is really important, Hilary? Yeah, uh, I think it is very, very important uh, that we uh, have uh, such uh, meetings, uh, round tables, uh, and uh, I'll be glad uh, to receive uh, uh, not uh, only from uh, five of you, uh, but also from the people uh, listening to this, any uh, suggestions, uh, any ideas, uh, how FEMS can uh, imp improve uh, uh, any uh, kind of uh, efforts uh, so that uh, our community is growing and being more successful. So, and uh, at the end, I just would like to thank Hillary and uh, Joe, who is in the backstage uh, <laughs> dealing with all this technical stuff. So, thank you all. No, thank you for, for making that. So, I was going to go around the room. So, Sylvia, please, any kind of burning final comment? Um, so, my final comment for today's discussion, which I really enjoyed it, and I think it has been very constructive, and, and I really hope that our audience is not just female scientists. I hope that there are men out there listening to us, because as we mentioned before, these challenges that we are facing will not be solved just from female scientists. It has to be a collective effort from everyone. Um, so... My final comment is that I choose to challenge um, these society stereotypes that uh, a woman can be only a mother, can be only a scientist, can be only one thing. A woman can be anything she wants to be, and she can be even better or as better as a, the male colleagues. So there's nothing that can stop us from pursuing our dreams and also moving forward into career, whether that's in academia or in the private sector, because we're female doesn't mean that we do not stand a chance. Um, yeah, and thanks again, all of you for this uh, great discussion today. Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great challenge. Diana, any burning comment that you haven't had a chance to say or any way to, to wrap up from you? I really just wanted to um, echo what Sylvia said, just definitely choose to challenge that na narrative around who's a scientist. We often get that a response oh you don't look like a scientist um when, whenever we say what, what we do um but yeah you, you can be anything you can have other passions other interests that make you you and it's it's important to bring those qualities and those skills that you learn from running a youtube channel or having a blog or being a science communicator along to your job and giving you that edge so challenge the fact that you don't look like a scientist and that you are an everyday person who has a job but you are um you are you so yeah that's my comment thank you so much for uh, uh, this discussion oh no that's that, that's fantastic thank you very much uh, egley to you please your final <laughs> burning comments <laughs> So first of all, I would like to thank everyone for the nice discussion. I was too nervous at the start and the time just passed. And I'm thinking just about one thing. If you are too shy to make the huge differences, if you are too shy to, I don't know, to make some huge, you know, moves front or something, just start from the little things. 
So Nico's challenges each day, step by step, and it's going to change. And that's how we change the policy here in Lithuania, step by step, moving slowly forward. And now we have pretty nice laws according to the to the maternity leaves and other, other policies uh, regarding the women in science. So just start from the small things. Don't be shy and keep them in mind each day and then challenge yourself as well each day. So thank you very much for this discussion. I'm very happy to participate. Oh, there's some more great points there. Love it. I absolutely love it. Ali, definitely last is not least. Over <laughs> to you. What's, what's your thoughts, please? Um, yeah, I think I think the choose to challenge um, theme is is really great theme. I do also think that it does come with a little bit of a caveat in that um, you know being in a position of privilege in order to be able to to call things out in in that way and challenge them in a very um, blatant and obvious way. But as Egle said, there's there's small things that you can do. Choose to challenge within your own circle where you feel comfortable um, and where you are respected. Choose to challenge yourself. Um, I'm sure that there's there's a lot of uh, introspection has been done over the course of this pandemic, but do continue to choose um, to challenge yourself as well and some of the biases that you have, the things that you can do in your life and um, to bring it forward. And, and I think we can't talk enough about these sort of like grassroots foundations. And um, we saw it in Ireland with legalizing abortion a few years ago. It all came from grassroots camp grassroot campaigns. Um, we saw it as well in Portland during the Black Lives Matters protests last summer and um, just how important these, these small community initiatives are. There is no set that is too small um, when we have such massive challenges to face. Superb, superb. Look, thank you very, very much, all of you. I've really enjoyed a chance to have a chat and I hope that we can meet in person soon. That would be just Wonderful. So we're going to sign off now. So from all of us, thank you very much.